how sometimes there is someone that you love a lot, like a family member or a friend, and they do something like they make a drawing and you think it's the best thing that has ever been drawn even though it's kind of okay? Well, that's pretty much the origin story of one of the greatest pieces of classical music, Pictures of an Exhibition, composed by Mussorgsky, who got inspired to compose this based on this picture. And to write this based on this picture, and who in turn inspire many, many composers to arrange it for orchestra and even a progressive rock album, question mark? So here's everything you need to know. Pictures of an Exhibition is a piece originally composed for piano by Modest Mussorgsky. And no, that is not a nickname I gave him, that was his name. He was a Russian composer and he had a bit of a love-hate relationship with his colleagues and his classical music surroundings. On the one hand, he took a lot of heat from a sector of composers or classical musicians of his time that used to say he did not have enough technique, that he had good ideas but his compositional technique was not there. He would would always fight back saying they were all conservatives and he was sick of all of them. But on the other hand, he was actually a part of a group of very famous composers of the time that we now call The Five, who used to champion to get a lot of Russian music or influences, folklore tunes into their music. So for a while he was a part of this group that was actually really influential, although Mussorgsky actually really struggled with alcoholism problems and towards the end of his life really fell out of love with the five as well, saying that they had all degenerated into soulless traitors. But the one person that did remain his dear, dear friend was Victor Hartmann, who was actually a pretty modest painter and architect of the time. But sadly, in 1873, Hartmann died suddenly and Mussorgsky was devastated. The Academy of Arts, where Hartmann had studied, did an exhibition with his paintings and his sketches. Mussorgsky visited, he was really touched. And that was when he decided to write pictures of an exhibition in honor of his friend. So the thing that makes this piece so cool is that as you listen to it, you really can imagine that this is Mussorgsky walking around and looking at the paintings of Hartmann. And the way that he makes you feel this is by composing two different types of numbers. There are ones that are called promenade, which means stroll or walk, and others that are called the names of the paintings that he is looking at. And he will put one promenade, one painting, one promenade, one painting, and so forth. The promenade has a really sort of simple theme that is going to repeat itself every time the promenade comes back, but every single time it will sound slightly different because it will reflect the mood that Mussorgsky is feeling as he is looking at this painting or that the painting before left him with. It has a really constant pace to give you the feeling of someone walking around the gallery and this is what it sounds like. There's a really simple trick that he uses here to make you feel like you're just walking around a gallery very randomly, not knowing where you're going, maybe something catches your eye and distracts you, and he accomplishes this by the way that he groups every single part. As you can see in the score, he goes from 6-4 bars to 5-4 bars to 6-4 bars and so forth. And this creates very irregular pacing. You know, you're not expecting an accent to fall in a certain place and then it does. And this is kind of what happens. You know, you think you're going that way, but oh, this painting catches your eye or, you know, something here. And that means that your movements are a bit random. And that's what he accomplishes by changing the meter so often. And then you have the numbers that are not the promenade, that each describe a different painting and I'll get to that after I talk about Ravel's orchestration. Because when Mussorgsky died, he had not played the piece in public and I think it was not even edited, it wasn't published. And once it did get published after his death, there was this frenzy of composers, conductors that wanted to arrange it for orchestra. I don't really know why, probably because it's such a great piece full of great tunes and 
rhythms and harmonies but in any case there is a massive list of people that attempted at an arrangement but the one that we use today for orchestra was done by Maurice Ravel. Ravel was actually kind of very used to doing this because he would write his pieces first for piano and then orchestrate them not as a rule but very often and he was a great orchestrator and the way that I can show you why his orchestration is so effective is by comparing it to another one. For example, we can compare a specific passage in one of the first pictures that is described to us, which is called Gnomus, which is like gnome. It depicts some creepy, weird gnome figure. It sounds perfectly fine, but take a listen to what Ravel does. The instruments that he chooses and what it makes them do give this whole passage such a creepy, airy aura. It sounds like some mystery thing from Harry Potter or Harry Potter sounds like this, but he has the strings doing this glissando, the sliding throughout all the notes, which really give a very sort of airy, creepy background. And then the orchestration that he uses for the main theme has celesta, which also brings this very kind of out of world sound that really emphasizes the strangeness of this known figure. And if you thought I was kidding about the progressive rock album, take a look at what this number sounds like by Emerson, Lake and Palmer, a 70s progressive rock band who did a cover of the whole of Pictures of an Exhibition. And you know, um, call me crazy, but it works. Good source material is good source material. Another example in the second picture that we hear, which is called Il Vecchio Castello, which means the old castle, which is one of my favorite numbers in anything. It has a sort of central melody, which is the core of this number, which is also very folksy Russian tunes. Stokowski chooses to give it to the English horn, which is perfectly nice and lovely. It's a great instrument. Take a listen. But Ravel actually gives that melody to the saxophone, which at the time and still now was not a typical instrument to see in a classical music orchestra. It was obviously very popular in jazz, which this must have been 1920, so you know, you get the context, but not in a classical music orchestra. So it makes it sound like it's, you know, the sound of the saxophone in the context of an orchestra sounds not as defined, definitely not as defined as an English horn. An English horn has a very sort of specific sound and the saxophone has a, you know, more open sound. And this makes it seem like this is a melody coming from afar or, you know, it, it makes it sound very melancholic. Take a listen. What Ravel does when he orchestrates is that he brings a lot of feelings, a lot of reactions to a melody just by the instrument he chooses to use, how he combines it with, well, I know I'm describing good orchestration, but it is very impressive how by switching an instrument, you can evoke so many different things and not do anything else. And so this is why Ravel ultimately won the battle of the orchestrations. Like I said, there were so many arrangements. There is even 
a Horowitz arrangement for piano, which is arranged from the orchestra version, which was arranged from piano, which I, why, I don't know why you bother, but maybe it's great. If you heard it, let me know. So even though Hartmann's pictures might not have been as legendary as Mussorgsky saw them, they did inspire Mussorgsky to write a pretty legendary, very famous, very important piece of music. So in the end, it's all good. Everyone's happy and thank you to all involved. And that is all for me as well. Thank you for watching. Uh, any thoughts, share them in the comments and I will see you next time. Oh, and classical musicians, did you know about this ELP Pictures of an Exhibition version? I didn't know about it and I got yelled by a friend that said that how can I not know that it existed? Anyhow, I'd be really curious if I was the only one leaving in a shoebox. Um, leave it in the comments. Now I'm going. Bye.